Okay, so check it out. My little, <clears throat> we, wine glass or no wine glass? Wine glass, it's... Five o'clock somewhere? No, it's, it's going on eight o'clock. That's prime time wine time. Just check it out. Are we like really doing this? We're rolling. Already rolling? Oh. You see me rolling, <laughs> hating, trolling, trying to get me riding, throw that trunk in the river. <laughs> I thought you were going to sing Rolling Down the River. <laughs> rolling, roll. We got a There's generation. A generational gap. Gap. Yeah, Generation, generational issue there. Sorry, guys. <laughs> Sorry, guys. I just got to call it like I see it. All right. <laughs> All right, so where, what are we up to? What's jump cooking in. here? Jump really? In. Yeah. Just jump in like with what's cooking. Okay, yep. great. So, uh, hey everybody, welcome back to the show. Yep. Uh, 57, this is the second time that me and the lovely are, are back reunited here at the Los Angeles HQ of the Good Dog headquarters, which is redundant. Yep. And, um, but we're happy to have you guys back. And uh, last time's show, I have to say, was one of my favorites. Um, I had a really good time with it, mm -hmm. so I'm hoping that this one doesn't suck by comparison. So Can't. that's my main goal, it's right? Impossible, right? We've got wine. How mm -hmm. bad can it be? How bad can it be? So uh, a couple things going on. This girl here flying out. You flying out Friday? Friday. Mm -hmm. Flying out Friday, Austin. Austin, Texas. Yep. Gelman. Gelman. Jeff Gelman. Jeff. Ge <laughs> uh, so Laura's flying out to uh, Austin, Texas for Jeff's um, RV dog trainer, right? Mm -hmm. And doing a two-day, two-day weekend thing. Yep. And Laura's going to, Laura documents and does a lot of like video work for uh, a lot of dog trainers and does some pretty cool stuff shooting and documenting um, their work and creating videos for their websites and all sorts of stuff. And they actually like, she's kind of like a big wig. They fly her all around. Around the country, super so she can fancy. super fancy, <laughs> so so she can shoot stuff and basically create content for their for the websites that are like super top notch, high end camera editing, the whole deal. The whole deal. It's pretty cool. Yeah. And maybe the best thing because of your acting background, she knows how to pull great stuff out of people, mm -hmm. even if you're really nervous on camera, mm -hmm. which has been pretty cool to see. Like, because there's been some folks that you've had that are like awesome people, but they're like. Hi, it's I'm hard. a dog yeah, trainer. It's hard to be yeah. on camera, even if you're like a great, like, personable person. Once that camera turns on and the light goes on, you're like, hello. I hello like to train you. dogs. <laughs> so, yeah, it can be really hard. So yeah, asking the right questions and getting the right kind of mood in the in the in the zone, you know, gets people um, really comfortable, and that's the best way to show them, you know, showcase them. And you're so good at that. I mean, Aww. if you have, um, honestly, like, Thank you. you have a very, very good. A uh, very nice disarming quality that that I think makes people feel, even if they're stressed, they're like, okay, I can yeah, let it hang out. It. Yeah, I can that's let cool. it hang out. So, yeah. so that's awesome. So we're gonna lose Laura for a couple of days. She'll be down there with Gelman and uh, and the fam because yeah. Gelman's got the whole crew. They're doing. 100%. He's gone for three months in that damn RV, and uh, you know, let's cross our fingers for marital bliss, <laughs> right? I mean, that's. Three months that's stuck in a motorhome together. Woo wee! Anyways, uh, okay, so that's going on. Um, we've got uh, some pretty interesting stuff. Bell's gonna do the wind chimes for us, just like last Q and A. So we got some pretty interesting stuff. Excuse me, I got something in my eye. Um, we've got a total revamp coming up of Q and A Saturday, right? Mm -hmm. Now I know you guys have like anybody who's followed us from the beginning has watched it kind of like shift and morph. Yeah, yeah. shift, shift and morph. Thank you. Yeah. It's a new dance crate sweep, sweeping the nation, swift and morph. And uh, it's gone from being very low key. Um, some would even say ghetto style. Like we really just kind of did it on the lowdown. And Junior, here we go. Jeff, he wants your camera. Junior, go. Go, Junior. Oh, he does it on purpose. Ah, he really does. Um, so we've gone from very, very kind of low production values to higher and higher cameras, lights. Uh, better editing, graphics, the whole deal. Now we're going up like 10 notches. Mm -hmm. We're going to have a new intro cut. Mm -hmm. 
fancy pants style. Um, Laura's got some big plans for some other things. So uh, so hold on to your hats because Q&A yeah. Saturday is going to get a heck of a lot better. We're going to just have some super fun with it because it started just as an idea like, hey, let's have some fun. But now we have a good little viewership. So mm. we're thinking, you know, let's... How do we spice it up yeah, and make it more fun for everybody? It great for everyone, yeah. And still balance out, obviously, like good information, you know, valuable learning information for everybody. Make sure you guys are all getting good stuff out of it. But what the heck, if we can get you laughing at the same time while you're learning, that's where it's all at. Laughing and learning. Laughing and learning. I'm going to get a t-shirt. <clears throat> and, uh, and then the last thing, uh, a little Coyote and the Pig shout out. <gasps> Anybody who's not following Coyote and the Pig, go to, go to Facebook or you can do Instagram too, right? Yeah. Go to, Bill, get out of here. Get out of here. Go. Watch out. Please don't knock the camera over. I'll just, Bell, I'll just, way down. Good girl. There we go. Um, so Coyote and the Pig is Laura's uh, fictional uh, story that she's been... How long have you been doing episodes of? I've been, wor I've been working on it since the end of 2011. But okay. I've written the story, like starting from the beginning of the story, since the beginning of this year. Okay, so you've been posting installments since the beginning mm -hmm. of this year. How many do you have? Do you know? So it's like nine or ten months worth of story. And like I do you know how many four episodes? Four times a day. So four times a, a week. I'm sorry. Have you so done any no loose episode, math? No. no, but you know, I mean, installments. I mean, you're talking about like like maybe a couple hundred. Oh yeah, definitely. Yeah, it's yeah. pretty cool. Yeah. So and it's not just any old story. It's pretty fascinating. And um, uh, the reason I wanted to shout it out today because she put up a post today that was like really fabulous. And and I was talking to her and I was getting a little teary-eyed a little joked up I get choked up yeah <laughs> it's such a great story and but if you read the story and you really look into what Laura's what what she's putting in there it's it's a great story about these animals but it's really about way more than that and um, and what she's going for is something that's really really special and so if you get a chance check it out support it just type in coyote and the pig in Facebook and you can find her there, and I'm, and then, but don't start at the end. Go back, Go and then, back to the beginning. and then, and then work your way If you're on Instagram, it's cool because Instagram, it's really easy to find. The first picture is the first installment of the right. story, so you can just go through. Um, awesome! Yeah. It's super awesome, and Aww. I don't just say that because you're here. Um, you guys are missing out if you don't if you don't read it. Aww, so, sweet. anyways, you ready to jump in? Let's do it. Hey, everybody! It's Sean from the Good Dog. Let's show up a little, little, little yeah, rhythm, rhythm change up. Yeah. And this to my right is the lovely Laura Morgan. Mm -hmm. Right? Any new nail color to show no, today? It's no, it's like I need to get them done. Oh, so Four we're hiding? Now yeah. we're concealing them? Okay. Well, they're kind of all over the place, so some Ooh, people might appreciate. We've got a little. Fun. Is that meant to be like yeah, two toned? Mean, Two tones. Okay, we're just checking it out. It's blue. There's blue well, the truth of the matter is that last episode was like literally taken over by your hair. Yeah. And every comment was like, that's the best show. Laura's hair and nails are fabulous. And I was like, what about all these great nice questions I answered, right? Come on. Yeah. So, uh, so you dominated last time. I'm going to dominate this time. <laughs> and, um, and so we're going to get into the show. All this good stuff, all this stuff you can't see off camera, all this stuff that I promise is surrounding us with all these fabulous dogs and whatever else good juju that we bring well, this is... This is the show. This surrounding isn't yeah. really the show. No, this is the show. Yeah, but I, I like to say like all this stuff because it's like everything, it's our whole world that we bring into but this. But it's like no one sees this world ever, so... I know, but I'm hinting at it. <laughs> I'm hinting at another world, a, a mystery like, world. It's like giant, like building. A fantasy <laughs> land, right? It's a fantasy land. All right, team, sorry, teammates, team. right? That's teammates. Team. Okay. Anyways, so this right here in front of us <laughs> is the good dogs. We are the good dogs. Q and A. Q &A. Oh, okay. This right here is Q and A Saturday, uh, and uh, this is episode. Yeah. This is episode number fifty-seven. Fifty-seven. Am I, am I good? Sorry. Thanks. And uh, and I say we just jump on into the show and see what we jump get. In. You yeah. ready? We've we got, got a... quite a few, so I'm going to keep some time here. You rock and roll. You hold me to it. All right. Grab that wine bottle on the way over and yeah. put a straw put a straw in it. <laughs> hey, everybody! <laughs> Send me your dog training questions. <laughs> Question number one. And I'll, oh, sorry. <laughs> no, we're on camera, so put it in the glass. <laughs> Question number one comes from Sue Reek 
Shercell. Okay. Sue says, I have two English Labradors, one female who's two and a male who's 13 months old. They both have a fear of little children when we walk. Yeah. Oh, and it's kind of scares me. We're at retirement age and no small children are present as they were growing up. Yep. If they see kids, one will start panning and wants to get away and will walk fast to get away. The older one has growled and lunged. I really don't know what to do to get them over this or at least not fear them on walks, especially if kids run up to us and ask, can we pet your dog? I tell them, no, we're in training. I now usually try to walk across the street. They like my niece's girl who's 10 and will play with her and no growling or sign of fear. Mm -hmm. My two-year-old did have problems the two-year-old dog had problems with fear and anxiety of watching your videos and using the prong and she's changed so much. Mm. My vet even said she's gotten better. I want to thank you guys all for the videos you share with us. Oh, Fabulous. Sue, that's awesome. Right. That's great. Yeah. Cool. So, Is that it? Yep. All right. So Sue's got two uh, two labs that are scared of kids on kids, walks, yep. right? Primarily is the issue, right? Yep. So she's got them on leash and prong. So glad those videos are helping. That's yeah. awesome stuff. Awesome. Um, what I would really, really, really love to uh, to uh, impart and implore you to go after would be the immaculate heel, the immaculate structured walk. And and you might already get have gotten them to by watching our videos not pull, and and you might have some good mechanics. But chances are the dogs are not in like a really, really immaculate heel and there's a reason for it. There's a value for that. You really want these dogs to be in a position that they're thinking about more about the position that they have to remain in than they are about all the stuff going on around them, whether it's kids or flying pigs or whatever else that might like freak them out. And so if you have their brains in a space where they're really focused on the work, it's a lot easier to keep them in a good spot. So that's the first thing. I would watch, um, I've got the walk video, which you've probably seen. Go over it again and watch like how meticulous I am about how that dog's position is. Don't mess around with that. You can get, you can get, you can get, um, not misguided, but you can get, um, what's the word? You can, not get off track. Off or, yeah, yeah, you get thrown off. I think you can get thrown off by the by the the depth of the value of that exercise, and you can mm -hmm. feel like if my dogs aren't pulling, we're co we're cool. Yeah. But it's so much deeper than, so that. Much more than that. So when we get dogs that have issues like that, all we do is ask. We demand a ton of them, and that demanding a ton of them puts them in a space of listening to us and the commands rather than getting into their own space of anxiety yeah. and fear and stuff like that. So that's super important. So immaculate structured walk. Um, I want you to shoot for that, that walk. What it entails is like 90, 10, 90% 90 of the walk is don't, don't move out of this position. Walk with me just like this. 10% of the walk, um, interspersed over the entirety of the walk is you giving at your discretion, a release command for the dog to sniff, pee, do whatever for like 30 seconds. And then boom, it's work time. Get those dogs in a work mode. Don't get them in a celebratory, like here's walk mode to mm -hmm. go like have fun. Your dogs are nervous on the walk. Yeah. Your dogs need leadership, guidance, consequences, rules, like walk like this and don't mess around. If you can really like slip into that mindset, that's the mindset where dogs will really like toe the line and will really prioritize what you're looking for over the anxiety and fear. So that's something really important. Um, so correct with a leash pop for any staring, like the very, very tip, tip top of, of escalation, right? You're walking down the street. You've now cultivated this immaculate heel. Some child is going by and you see whichever one of your dogs or both start to like look, ears come up. Bang, correct, right there. No, and pop, and do it nice and firm. Your whole goal is to block this emotional cycle and escalation of like, I see that, I get worried, I have a reaction. Your job is, I see that, block, and I don't get worried. And if you can do that, if you can see and understand the value of that, and you can really hold on to it, and you can start to implement and create a habit that, that, that you can hold on to for your dogs, you'll see them start to break out of that cycular right? Secular, uh, emotional kind of habit pattern of I see this and I feel this way. Mm -hmm. So I can't stress enough how correcting early for dogs that are nervous is the gateway to them learning how to tolerate stuff that freaks them out. And then 
Beyond that, teach duration place and practice a hell of a lot more structure in the house to get these dogs calm, relaxed, and not freewheeling. If your dogs are wandering around all day and then you're just like doing a structured walk or trying to do a structured walk, you're missing a lot of moments to be able to influence your dogs to teach them like calming exercises and how to be relaxed and that they need to listen to you and that you guys run the show and all those things that help dogs feel more comfortable and secure in their own skin. So you can watch our place command video, but don't just like put them on place and be like, they know place. Place. place is like two to three hours a day yeah. like teaching your dog don't not move your butt off there I say donut donut <laughs> I'm what am I thinking about? I haven't had sweets in a long time. Uh, do not move your butt off that place command no matter what and you will start to see better stuff outside as well so those are my recommendations for you guys and uh, um, I, and then the little note I put on the side is be totally meticulous. And I mean that to the nth degree. That's how we get what we get. And when we see owners struggle when the dogs go home, it's because they're being less meticulous. Yeah. It's, it's as simple as small little moments being missed, missed, missed. And then things start to slide. It's the old slippery slope. The old slippery slope. Um, it's such, such important stuff that you do keep saying, my dogs are in training. If you need to get them little vests or something, especially for the one that growls, not saying that they'll bite, but they might bite. So be really cautious. If yeah. you do have kids running up to you, get the little, you know, caution vest so that the parents can be warned when they see the caution yeah. vest that like caution do not pet or in training do not pet um or just being really like really firm with kids like stepping in front of your dogs no just they're in training you know don't have any shame about that because the dogs are going to see you step up like that and you could save you know save your kids for, or save your dogs from getting in a, a bad situation and the kids in a bad situation yeah absolutely yeah okay. good advice cool Okay. We got Big Al. We've got question number two. This is from Al Elliott. Hey, Al. Al says, I have a question. I just am watching the DVD we bought last month. It's awesome. Oh, man. Thanks. Um, Glad you like it. Our 20-month-old Roddy Puff has turned into a, turned a huge corner with fear aggression. Cool. He never actually attacked anyone, but he reacted badly to a larger male dogs, and now he can walk past other dogs and turns his head. Great. Um, even though his tail is still in a question mark. I don't I'd know. i stop that to his point. I don't but Roddy's typically don't have tails. <laughs> that's why I got... Roddy mix? I don't know. I, that's why I got lost. <laughs> I'm lost a little bit on this one, Al, okay. to, to be honest. In the house, he loves to chase shadows. If we move, he'll be up and trying to bite the floor. It all seems very good-natured and never gets upset or overstimulated. Uh -huh. Is this harmless or should we be trying to discourage it? Thanks in advance. Al. 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 Thanks for buying the DVD, buddy. Yeah. I'm, I'm glad it's helping, so and, glad. and it's really cool that, uh, was it reactivity stuff he was dealing yeah. with? Yeah, mm -hmm. so great. Your awesome. dog turning his head is like kind of the beginning of a little bit of avoidance stuff of yeah. like, I don't want to look at that because I, I can't really manage myself yeah. when I do. That stuff will get milder and milder as time goes on, so good work. Um, I would definitely correct and discourage any of that shadow chasing stuff. It's bad news bears. Yeah. Um, that's a dog who's practicing OCD-like behaviors and it's uncomfortable for the dog, it's bad for the dog, it's detrimental. It can look like play and it can look like fun. Um, but I've seen that stuff just spiral, spiral, spiral and it doesn't get better, right? It, you start to get a dog that can't like can't be anywhere else emotionally, but like in that space of hunting for shadows. And it's the worst thing. It's like your Did, dog can like I add to this? Yeah, I was just gonna say just the one last thing is that yeah. you like your dog will literally disappear into like pathological behavior, yeah, you know, just yeah. disappear into O C D stuff. What were you gonna say? Um, just Andrea commented on it and she said Andrea's our deputy. Mm -hmm. TGD um, Deputy dog. She said, I have no idea what Sean will say, but that kind of makes me uncomfortable. It's on the OCD side. Does he break mm -hmm. command place, for instance, to chase shadows? If so, this is a no-no. Getting it under control will help with that last bit of leash aggression. Yep. And then Al said, that's my feeling too. I want him to f have fun and play, but it's always made me feel like he's obsessive. I made the huge mistake of letting him chase laser pointers when uh. he was a pup, and that's had an effect. Well, don't make him feel bad. I think it'll no. Work. I'm not making Al feel bad. I just, it's a bummer because, it's a hard one, yeah. yeah, because so many people 
so many people do it and yeah. it's not I'm, I'm not hard timing Al at all it's I've just I've seen so many dogs um, struggle from the laser pointer thing there's something about it that yeah. causes a lot of obsessive behavior yeah. with it so yeah so don't feel guilty you just have to kind of deal with it and just kind of work through it um, so I'd love for you to practice um, a lot more duration place command yeah and um, and if he breaks for a shadow, correct, it's a big correction, right? Yeah. So like, she's reading my mind over here. So no, no, I, I love when you read my mind. So uh, so duration place command, which is not just about like he can't chase the shadows. It's about getting his mind into a more structured, relaxed zone. But if he does break to go chase, like Laura said, big correction, right? Mm -hmm. You want to use the training to override, and you've heard me say this like already tonight, but in all the other videos as well. You want the training to override that impulse, and the impulse is. I see that and I want to go do this. And what you want is place command is more valuable than anything else in your world. And he goes like, there's a shadow over there. I'll just hang tough. And after a while, he gets uh, that, that feeling dissipates, that intensity. Hercules! <laughs> that intensity dissipates. But yeah, it's definitely something that you would want to discourage. It's most likely only going to get worse. And, uh, and it can be a challenging one to break through. So... Um, don't don't chalk it up to being fun. Don't chalk it up to being play like yeah. let him play yeah. outside, find a different way. Herc. Herc. Herc's Herc's dreaming. Loud dreaming dog. Um, it, let him play and do the fun stuff outside, sure. but but not the inside like chasing stuff. Yeah. Hercules. Herc is the loudest dreamer in town. Question number three, this comes from Laura. Laura says, Sean, thanks for answering my question two weeks ago about my dog's recall and not responding with the e-collar. Yeah. You were right on with what was going on and how to fix it, and he's no longer freezing. Oh, that's awesome. Cool. Look at me. Look at you. I know what I'm doing. My one-year-old mini schnauzer is a bit fearful. He's done all the foundation work and the e-collar has been layered over the commands. Lately, when we enter the training club and there's different dogs and people there, he doesn't want to go into the building. And when I get him in there, he tries to hide under chairs, behind garbage cans, and sometimes growls at people. Um, dog clubs in this area do not allow e-collars, but I can use the prong. I try to get him to place her down with a prong, but as soon as I release the pressure, he's up off place or the down. When, is this ugly, when this ugliness is over, I put him in the crate. Should I stop him from hiding? Any suggestions on how to better handle this situation? Thanks, you guys are the best. Mm. So super happy that those recall suggestions helped. Yeah. Um, always right. challenging to give like remote advice yeah. and, and uh, makes me really, really happy that that, that worked out for you. Um, so first of all, so you got a year old schnauzer. Schnauzers are, are really notorious for being like high strung, super anxious, and uh, oftentimes it can be a they can be a bit of a wreck. Um, and I don't mean your dog's a wreck, but we see a lot of them here that are a wreck where they just shake and can barely manage manage themselves. Just so you 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 may have a dog that's not, at least at this point in his life, cut out for that kind of like high stimulation, high challenge environment yeah. and able to be successful in it. He may not be genetically predisposed to be able to handle that right now. Now that doesn't mean that you can't make huge improvements and stuff down the line, but if, if that's what's going on right now, you're not allowed to use e-collar, so you got limits on your tools. He's super uncomfortable. All he's trying to do is flee, and it's supposed to be like a positive experience of like training and stuff like that. Yeah. It doesn't sound like much positive stuff is going on. That's mm -hmm. no diss on you. It's just that where he's at and the tools you're allowed to use, I just don't think it's going to be very beneficial for you. Yeah. So first, he may not be genetically predisposed to being ready to handle this stuff right now. Um, Personally, um, I would proof him in environments like I would kind of like I, if it was me, I would forego the training, the training club, and I would proof him like a mother on e-collar stuff on yeah. all of his commands somewhere else. I'd get him so rock solid on all of those commands in challenging situations, but just not something that blows his mind that he can't be successful at, and then slowly, incrementally build it up, build it up, build it up, and see what you can get out of him. You may be able to get him in six months to a place where he's such a freaking rock star that he can handle that stuff, yeah. that he can go there even without an e-collar and be awesome. But like, don't let the limitations of that club cause you and your dog to have limitations that you could that, guys to backslide. that you can get yeah. over, right? Right? Mm -hmm. So like if he was my dog and I was really determined to get him as best as he could, I would be proofing him and busting his butt on the e-collar 
in all sorts of situations and contexts in order to get him to be the best he can possibly be. And then I'd gauge, like, cool, he's pretty damn solid. He's a, he's a million miles from where he was when we were at the club. And then decide if you want to go back in and start working on that stuff. But to be honest, like, I have a real kind of, like, sticking point for, like, not being able to use the tool that works best for my dog. Yeah, that's and, you know what I mean? Like, yeah. so like having to go to a place and I get the social hang and I get the, like the training vibe and all that, but it's like, my dog needs an e-collar to do his best and I can't use it. So but become... he may be like, oh, sorry, I, keep, I feel like I keep cutting you off today. Go ahead. You are. And it's, it's quite, quite painful. Um, so, um, I don't know what I was going to say. You're just saying like the e-collar, like having someone, having them tell you that you can't use the best tool for your dog. It just feels like... Not. Yeah, it just doesn't feel like the most productive way to go about getting your dog into a better space. You're having to acquiesce to like somebody else's, you know, rules. But what if your dog like needs this? So um, uh, that that that's that's where I would go with it. And um, let me just finish out my notes before I let you jump in here. Um, bu -bu 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 um, as for the leash and prong stuff, like. The reality is you're going to be super limited, right? So there's only so much you can do. And you already said, like, you put him in place. And as soon as he, like, feels the pressure of the leash go away, he's gone, right? It's, it's a losing battle. I, I think you're going to actually, like, if you continue to do this, you're most likely going to cause more harm than good. Because I think your dog's just getting patterned to be, like, freaked out in this situation. And as soon as you're don't have pressure on the leash or you're far enough away from your dog <clears throat> if he's that scared the fear is just going to override and he's just going to be gone so that would be the magic of the e-collar um, and doing that work elsewhere is that you could supersede or override that anxiety and eventually condition him to listen to you rather than listen to his fear but that's something that you're not able to do in his most challenging situation so that's a hard one what were you going to say jump in no just uh yeah i feel like um does he really enjoy the dog club it doesn't sound like it, yeah. you know, I think the dog club, you know, is, is, sounds like a cool idea if you've got the right dog, but if it, if it's more for you than it is for him, I just feel like maybe take a good look at that. Um, because there's ways for him to socialize and there's ways for him to bond with people or bond with you that are maybe something that he's more comfortable with. I'm just wondering if you want to, uh, just look at like, what's the reasons for the, the dog club yeah. and, and if it is more more selfish, which I think I'm not saying that you're selfish, but like going to more a dog park her. can be, yeah. yeah, more about like social hang or seeing the dogs play or something. Just really check in like, okay, is that worth it for my dog to have this like traumatic experience where he's not allowed to be regulated by me on an e-collar. He's feeling like he wants to hide. He can't even hold position. He can't be he, successful. Yeah, he can't be successful, yeah. but he's also like... He's, he knows place and he knows down, but he can't even do it because his brain is so overwhelmed. Yeah. Like if I didn't, if I couldn't do something that I know at a place, I know it's because I'm pretty freaked out. So yeah. just check in with that, you yeah. know? And if it is like, oh, but once he gets past this, then he's fine and loves it. Then we need to just find a way to like get through those moments, but maybe just look at the whole big picture and see yeah. what you want to I do agree that. a thousand percent with what you said. I think it's a no win situation yeah. for, for you and your dog right now. Yeah. And that's a bummer. Yeah, so, especially uh, with those schnauzers, just you can have so much more fun with them, just like training them yourself or yeah. having like one friend that they're into or whatever. But, just so many of them are so high strung yeah, that I, like, I just, yeah, yeah I, I just, I picture some of the ones we've worked with trying to be in like that kind of situation. Club, and I'm like, they'd just be uncomfortable. Yeah. yeah. And that, I think what Laura said is so important to think about, you know, it's like we have the, these intentions or these goals, like let's do the dog club. It'll be fun. It'll be yeah. a way to connect, train my dog, dog social hang, it. all yeah. this stuff. The reality is a lot of dogs don't dig it. Mm -hmm. And so basically your dog is having to like be subjected to like, I'm really uncomfortable. Yeah. Now, if you want to improve him, improve him, but improve him in a situation where you use the right tools and you can incrementally build him up into a place of confidence. Yeah. So that's, cool. that's my, that's my two cents. Thank you. Thanks. Okay, question number four. This is from Jean. My yes. middle name, by the way, just so you know. George Peach. Um, 
Thank you both for answering my question in episode 56 about the remote collar. We are can't wait for your DVD to come out. By the way, awesome. Laura, your hair looks fantastic. See, taking over this episode too. Uh, no, that was last <laughs> last. The question I now have is, is it possible to over nag with the prongs so that they no longer pay attention? Mm -hmm. I do not think I have, but the class trainer, the last class coming up, mentioned I talked to him much with the talk to him too much with the lead. She likes a fair amount of lead between the collar and your hand. I prefer a shorter amount since it gives me a better feel of what's going on. I try for the structured heel in class where he has um, to pay attention to me. Yep. The instructor now wants me to use a halty, which I'm not comfortable with at all. Says um, since he, know, he and the guy says he's no longer pays attention to the prong. Yet at home on walks, I use the prong, and if he acts up, I put him in a sitter down. If he starts to jump in the air, I'm already moving the opposite direction. He doesn't pull me when acting up; just goes on his hind legs. I've started to walk him now with a hmm. muzzle on. He's never bit anyone, but it's for his protection, especially finding out what legal consequences I could be if I physically stopped someone. It's hard to him. Yeah, yeah. That last sense. Yeah. Okay. Or couldn't stop somebody. Oh yeah, okay, yeah, something yeah. like that, right? Okay, so Gene. Um, so the prong, like over yeah, nagging. Basically. Yeah, yeah. So I always have issues with like trainers, kind of like pushing people into tools they're not down with. Especially mm -hmm. if they're finding, you know, like the the trainer's job is to be the expert and say, hey, you should try this, try yeah. this, and this works good. But like, if you've got something you're feeling good about and empowered with, I'd be really cautious about like deviating from that. So, um, and as far as like nagging or desensitizing your dog to the prong, here's how you do it. Here's how I've seen clients do it. They have a leash and prong, and they let the dog pull on it, and they pull a commensurate amount of pressure or apply a commensurate, a commensurate amount of pressure yeah. to the dog consistently. And what happens is the dog never learns how to turn the pressure off, mm -hmm. right? It's like this goes on Just forever, right? Yeah. And after a while, Laura doesn't even know that I'm doing this. And meanwhile, I'm like, hey, don't you hear me? And she's yeah, yeah. like, I haven't heard you for 10 years because yeah, yeah. you've been it's doing this been forever. Like that. yeah. So that's how you get a prong collar to not mean anything. Right, you you apply pressure and you leave it on and you let the dog pull consistently, um, or or just let him apply pressure consistently and never teach him how to release the pressure. Um, what else was I gonna say? Uh, ba, ba, ba. And then then the only other way to like kind of like to nag it and make it have no value is of course if you are doing corrections, having them have no value, right? So say you are keeping the leash loose, but when you need to communicate with the dog, you're doing these really light little whispery prong corrections, your dog's not gonna care about it if he's like intense at all and he's gonna just do his own thing. Um, but it sounds like from what you're saying, when you're at home, you can get him to do things that you want yeah. and walk a certain way and do all this. My suggestion would be, if you like the leash and prong, use the leash and prong, but be a little more firm with it, mm -hmm. right? So I don't have any problem with using a short leash. It's up to you and your trainer how you guys want to approach that. I like that concept. But when a dog is like, when a dog knows a command, sit, down, place, heel, whatever, and he breaks it, at that point, accountability is incredible incredibly important and that's when you have to use a correction that's valuable enough for your dog to make better decisions moving forward so that's uh that's super important um what was i going to say also uh ba -ba 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 -ba, the halty we covered that um yeah and I, like i said it's only nagging if the dog doesn't care about the tool or the corrections so my suggest oh oh the other thing i was going to say is that you say, I think when he gets worked up, he stands on his hind legs. Mm -hmm. So yeah, there's some stuff on the walk that's not great going on. I right. feel like, yeah. Mm -hmm. So, so I mean, that could be why the trainer is saying like a yeah. halty because maybe he feels like you're out of control. And like, yeah. I don't have boots on the ground, so I don't want to. I don't want to disparage what what he's recommending, yeah. even though I was kind of like, eh. If the prong is working great for you, then that's great. If you feel like um, you're a little bit out of control and your trainer feels like you're a little bit out of control, then maybe it's time to look at something else. But here's what I would do first. I would start upping your consequences, um, upping your conversation with the leash and prong to where it has value, to where when you do correct, you see a state change in your dog. He doesn't just slow down momentarily. He doesn't just like stop looking momentarily. Mm -hmm. There's a state change. Ears go back, forehead relaxes, body kind of chills out, that kind of stuff. And then as far as like the coming up on his back legs, that's bad news bears. That's super like bratty, unacceptable, yeah. reactive behavior. Here's what I do. 
Dog comes up on his back legs. I very calmly take the leash with two hands, lowers the dog, prong and leash like this, pop, nice and sharp to the side. The dog goes, whoa, jumping up on my back legs really sucks yeah. and starts to make different choices. Now, if you just stand there and let him do it or like I'm gonna ignore it or whatever, you're going to probably get more and more and more of it. But the, the whole thing is to really like create a significant consequence for that crappy choice to where your dog starts to make a different choice. And then your trainer might be like, whoa, Leash and prongs working really great for yeah. you because your dog doesn't jump up anymore. He's healing really nicely. He's not hassling any other dogs because the way you're communicating through the leash is valuable. Yeah. So being too soft can definitely undermine the value or just applying pressure consistently and not releasing it can also numb or desensitize your dog to uh, the leash and prong. But it's, it's hard to do. Do you know what I mean? We get dogs in here that are all that have been like a mess on leash and prong, yeah. and as soon as you teach them correctly how to how to how to give to pressure, mm -hmm. they tend to do really well. So the thing that I'm seeing, Jean, is that you've got a big Roddy. So if this is the dog in question on your profile picture, is and I'm not trying to stalk you, but you know she is. I am. Um, you know, a big Roddy. It sounds like if you've got a Roddy that's kind of disrespectful and and doing that kind of behavior on a walk. It's typically a dog that, like, you probably have some other issues, like... Relationship-wise? Yeah, relationship-wise. Like, inside the house, those guys are, like, can be pushy if they're allowed to push. So I would really love to see a whole comprehensive thing go on, yeah. like, much more place inside the house, duration stuff, no affection. Like, if you're getting... If you're, if you're to the point where you're putting a muzzle on him because he's being bratty and kind of blah yeah. Yeah. and this sort of thing on the walk. It's just typical kind of rotty stuff. So I would say take a look at that. And, um, I mean, what we'd love to see, what I'd love to see is get you on an e-collar if you're still having trouble. Because yeah. the prongs, sometimes, sometimes rotties, their necks are so... They don't really care yeah. about the yeah. prong collars. So. Yeah, could that that could be less about you not doing it right yeah. and more about just the the, the, the Roddy being like really yeah, like, like iron neck. Yeah, dare you. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So um, check those things out. But, yeah. but I think that's really good, strong, strong advice, which is the comprehensive thing. I mean, there's yeah. no doubt that if we could peek into your household with your dog, yeah. we'd see things and we'd go, that's not so good. Yeah, and that's exactly. adding to the mixed message. Yeah. And like Laura was saying, like, if you're doing a ton of affection to a dog that's being a jackass like that, or he's got tons of freedom or tons of access to your personal space, yeah. those are all mixed messages that are gonna hassle you on the yeah. walk. So until, like for us, like we get board and trains, like if you could treat this dog like a board and train, you could really do some stuff. Yeah. When we get dogs like that, they don't get affection, they don't get touched, they don't get pet, they don't get nice, kind words spoken to them until they turn the corner and give us respectful behavior. Mm -hmm. So that's the carrot. That's what you hold out and that's what you say. When you give me the nice stuff, I'll give you the nice stuff. Yeah. Until then, it's going to be a little cold. It's going to be like Siberia here, mm -hmm. baby cakes. So cool. anyways, All right. ready? Siberia, baby cakes. You like that one? I love it. All right. All right, that was a long one, long answer, so let's speed this one up. Shake it up. Question number five is from Casey. Casey says, I want to thank you guys for answering my question. Laura, your hair looks great, and I used the same stop the nail biting technique. I just painted the ones that were kind of weird. Did you just do it? Yeah, you got me, you got me all weird and weirded oh, out about it. No, they look great. I like that um, color. Yeah, I like the blue. What is the shade? Shade of... Um, oh, it's not even locked. High speed, fast no, no, dry. No, that's not... <laughs> Milani nail lacquer. Know, where do you find the Where do you find the name? The bottom or the top? It's number thirty-five. No. Blue zoom. Blue zoom. Blue zoom. It's Bro. like, is it called high speed faster? <laughs> it's okay. You're a boy. All right. Casey says, um, we've decided to get the e-collar and start it with him working on it, place and recall. But I'm thinking the whole obedience thing, so we can get him off treat training. Unfor ultimately, we want to get Gimli, our pity pup, certified with the CGC, the Canine Good Citizen. Have you guys had any experience with certification in the use of e-collar and training for certification? Both the e-collar and CGC seem to be more about having a balanced dog, which is what we're after holistically, but we also want him to be a good breed ambassador for pit bulls, and CGC is a good start for that, we think. Have you used e-collar training for CGC or had any experiences to share? Thank you so much for doing these Q&As. Even Cliff Note versions help. Ah. 
You are so welcome, Casey. Uh, good question, actually. So we don't do a lot of canine good citizen no, stuff. We're typically um, just trying to get them... Because we, we, don't, we don't get a lot of canine good citizens here, to be perfectly honest. We get a lot of dogs that are kind of like much more messy. Yeah. So we're trying to get them not to bite, not to bite other dogs. And so we kind of have a different, a different thing or different agenda. Um, the only dog I've ever done a canine good citizen test with which, uh, was with Belle. Oh. Yeah. And, uh, and she passed with flying colors because Belle's magic She's dog. Perfect. And um, she, she gets more credit for that than I do. But um, I don't think that you're. You, I, I know somebody in the in the in the questions or in the comments left you um, uh, left you a link. Yes, yeah. with all the rules, so you can check that out. I don't think you're allowed to use an e collar for for any of that. I don't think you're allowed to use a prong collar either. I think it's pretty like. No. No. Tell me, got one e dog. I think it's pretty strict about what what tools you can use. But mm -hmm. here's the thing, Casey is that you could use uh, leash and prong, you can use e-collar, and you can do all this training prior, right? Mm -hmm. Get the dog rocking and rolling on e-collar, like get the most like immaculate, amazing stuff to where the dog like is proof for sits and downs and recalls around heavy distractions, mm -hmm. stuff you can't do with just like long line and leash and prong and really get the dog into an amazing space, pattern that, and then take the tools off, practice a little bit without the tools, see how the dog's doing, and then take your canine good citizen test. I mean, if, if, that was, if it was me and, and I was trying to work through that stuff and I had a dog that had some challenges, I would absolutely train him with an e-collar and then lose it for the, test for the test and make sure the dog's rocking and rolling on his own. Yeah. So I think that's the strategy that I would go with. And um, yeah, yeah I, I, think, I think you should be able to make some good stuff happen. Yeah. Work it out. Work Let it out, lady. It Work it out. We'd love to know. Yep. Thanks, Casey. Thanks. Oh, you know what I'd like to do before we wrap today? Yeah. Uh, with your phone, when we're done, take a quick selfie because oh, okay. I want to post it and like kind of like advertise. Oh, cool. All right. Cool. Don't let me forget that. Okay. Blue Question, Zoom. <laughs> Question number six is from Bethany Wilson Davison. She's um, an oldie buddy goodie with us, right? I know. Bethany says, Hi, Sean and Laura. I'm a hey. little behind and watched episode 51. Mm. Just watched it, so ignore me if you happen to answer this one recently. Okay. As you know, I lost my GSD this summer. Mm. I'm so sad. We currently have added a Border Collie, four-ish, um, that's right, a Border Collie. He's a really great, even-tempered, and taking to the training like a champ and already helping me to work on other dogs. Great. He started on prong. We've been doing e-collar training for a few days. No issues. He's sensitive and loving to dogs and humans. Well, all that sensitivity and love goes out the window when it comes to squirrels and cats. It's pretty bad. If it wasn't bad, I wouldn't ask for help. Mm. So normally I would just correct it, and I plan to, but I hear you and Jeff talk about crittering more and more, and I'm thinking we should do some of this to get him in a lower level of intensity before outright correcting him. Mm -hmm. Is that the point of crittering to settle the dog down before working on walking by the critter? Or if I want to do an off-leash border collie sooner rather than later, should I just go strong correction-wise and let him know to stay away? What would you do? Um, et cetera, et cetera. Et cetera, et cetera. Yeah. I like this place command, by the way. There's a certain Malinois who's crawled under the table all the way over to Mommy's legs. No, it's not Mommy's legs. It is Mommy's legs. Okay, so Bethany, uh, good question, right? So there's been a lot of talk about crittering stuff. <laughs> Sorry, Kujo's stuck under the table because he's too big. Kujo? Um, sorry. Sorry, guys, are a little distracted. So there's been a lot of talk. A lot of it has come from, from Jeff talking about this mysterious crittering video that I have. That you're supposed right? to have, yeah. I'm supposed to have this mysterious crittering video where I, where I decode and share all of the deep mysteries of crittering and how it works, but I never, I never shot it. I don't have it. I've never seen it. I'm not aware of it. So um, I have done crittering stuff, as has Laura. Um, but to be honest, I, I don't... I haven't found the value for this kind of stuff um, that I that I think has been purported to be available. Now that doesn't mean that that somebody else isn't able to do it, but I've been out there and been pretty consistent about trying to make some stuff happen with crittering, and I haven't found it work towards getting dogs to ignore um, critters or things like yeah. that, or even like dog-to-dog -dog aggression. What I do use it for and what we have used it for is, say we've got a really reactive dog and we need to get that dog 
closer to another dog to be able to like for whatever reason right i've got a dog that's just out of its tree and i need to i want to try and like break through some of that and get him closer to another dog then i'll use crittering like that to just slow the dog down quiet the dog down relax the dog and de-escalate him and then within like 10 minutes i can usually be like right next to the dogs in question because what you do is you slowly dissipate that stress and stuff but it's really kind of a different dynamic than it is with critters right More so like fear stuff with that too it's like got more fear with dog stuff, stuff? yeah with yeah. the crittering stuff yeah yeah but with the with what she's talking about a good correction so 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 check this out right so so what i found so so first of all i wouldn't go with crittering um for this um, I would think of crittering kind of in a different category, and that's just me, but I would use it for any time I need to like get a, an aroused dog de-escalated over a short amount of time uh, closer to another dog so we can make progress from there. But what I would do and what I have done and what works really, really well, we have this park down the street tons of squirrels we've had plenty of dogs with squirrel issues and and all sorts of stuff whether it's cats or squirrels it doesn't matter um i'd work on having that recall like rock bomb proof solid Mm -hmm. right and don't do it at the park don't do it with squirrels do it in the house do it in the backyard do it in a parking lot whatever get that recall so it's so rock solid and get your dog to corrections and that means that like you call the dog he doesn't come running you repeat the command with a nice firm pop tap on the on the on the e collar and your dog moves his butt back over to you like lightning. So that's the first order of business. Get that solid. Then go to an environment where you've got these challenges. Long line on your dog, say fifty footer. Yeah. Right. You go out. You let your dog have five feet of leash anywhere proximity wise, like to something like a target. Your dog tries to make a, a beeline for that, you recall your dog. If your dog doesn't respond, you dial up nice and high and you get that dog back to you, right? I don't care if your dog typically recalls at 25, he sees the squirrel. The trick is like, don't let him get too far afield, keep him close and catch him really high early in the sequence, right? So he sees the squirrel, he starts to move, he's four feet from you, come, pop, boom, your dog turns around. The whole thing is the closer the dog gets to the target and further the dog gets from you, the harder it is for the dog to listen to you, the higher level corrections you need, everything gets more challenging. So all I picture in my head is dog with a great recall, owner that or, or handler that's got good sense of, of the e-collar and dialing up, long line on, go out, here's the challenges, I give you a few feet, I recall you back. I give you 10 feet, I recall you back. I give you 20 feet, I recall you back. And I just keep doing it over and over again. And then a very fascinating thing happens psychologically for a dog when you do this. What happens is there's a thing I want and I've been seeing it and, de- de- and, and, and not devouring it, but desiring it. I'm like, uh, I'm like in a maniacal state. And what's happened is I've recalled, I've without anybody like holding me and pulling me back, I've actually like made a decision because of e-collar pressure to turn my butt around and come back, right? So something pretty profound happens when an animal goes, I want this and I'll turn around and come the other way. And you do it over and over and over again. And in some ways, it's got a crittering flavor. Crittering tends to be more of like way low level, way more meticulous and, 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 a, and, and a little bit more of a structured thing. But I'm telling you, I find way more value in slowly recalling dogs back. And by slowly, I mean like the distance or the closeness you get to the animal and just doing that over and over again to the point, junior, to the point where like you're at a 50 foot line that you're holding, you let your dog get it's starting to like, you know, like look at another critter or something like that. You recall that dog, he doesn't come running, you roll up real high and you recall, you give that command again, your dog comes running. And, and you do that enough and you will break that desire, that habit, that like instinctual, like I'm just out of here kind of thing. And, and you'll find a dog that will actually like, honestly, you do that enough, the dog will walk by stuff. He'll walk by squirrels, it'll walk by cats and go, there's no point in me running because all that ever happens is I get recalled away and it, I never get what I want. 
right? So that's really the strategy for that. So I jettison the crittering thing and I would go for solid recall, then long line, and then slowly build it out around distractions and critters and things like that, starting with very short distances, high enough level corrections that your dog really cares about it, and then build it out, build it out, build it out until your dog like sees a squirrel and he's like, man, I don't want anything to do with that, and like comes running back. So, cool, cool. that's it. Thanks. All right, question number seven. It's a sad day. It's from, <laughs> comes from Kelly. Kelly says, do you have any tips for when couples combine households? Um, I have two dogs, he has two dogs. They Prenup. Get along, huh? Prenup. Yeah. They get along pretty well um, when they're all together, although play can sometimes get a little out of hand. Mm -hmm. They've never spent really long periods of time together. I want to make the transition smooth as possible, and my main concern is all of them staying safe. That's a good concern. Yes. Okay, Kelly, whoops, got my notes here because this needs notes. So, slow and cautious is always the very best strategy. So we don't have dog fights here, right? Unless we've set something up on purpose with a dog who's muzzled to trigger him to go after a dog, we don't have like random dog fights here. And what's the reason that we don't have random dog fights here? We move very slow and we're very careful. Absolutely. And what happens is when you move very slowly and very carefully, that, that initial stress trigger that can be really elevated, that novelty of being around new dogs, of being unsure of the dog's intention, uh, of not having the personality kind of dynamics worked out, create a very high possibility for dog fights or trouble or stress um, or tension and things like that. So that's like A number one, move slow, right? And, and that means like if they're gonna be playing, um, so for one, they're never unsupervised, right? At this point in the game, yeah. you if you're leaving the house, either you crate the dogs, mm -hmm. uh, crate a portion of the dogs, or separate them in the backyard or different places in the house, something like that. You absolutely can't risk like having dogs sort it out themselves. Now on top of that, the way that you really make all this dynamic work is by letting the dogs hang in the house of course, if you did more training, you'd have even more leverage for the dogs to be in a good space, mm -hmm. right? But I'm talking like just going off what you shared, which is more a little bit more loosey-goosey. Dogs hanging out, playing. If you see any bullying, you correct it firmly straight away. You see any play where it's not reciprocal, meaning one dog is worried about the play and the other dog's excited and being pushy about it, you intervene immediately. If a human doesn't intervene and a human allows boundaries to be pushed and dogs to be compromised, what you will get is tension and anxiety and stress built up with each other and you'll develop personality clashes and things like that and you can have major, major problems. Now, on top of that, even if you do do all that great stuff, you can still have personality clashes. You can still have dogs that just don't dig each other, that just don't dig the cut, what is it, the, the cut, cut, of of, cut, of, cut of their jib. You just like, some dogs don't want to be around other, they don't want to be around each other. Yeah. And to be honest, there's not a whole lot you can do in that situation. You can try and be a hard ass and like, just run run your place like a like a military prison if that's a good example um, and um, and and make sure that the dogs all know like unequivocally do not mess around but still it's really hard if you if you do have dogs that have got like personality clashes or weird tension between them it can be very hard to change that the best way to avoid it like I said is to start slow advocate, make sure there's no bullying, no crappy behavior, everybody's being like the most sweet, polite dogs, and that's gonna give you your best shot at having, at having a good situation. But training them and doing, doing some like place command and, and all that stuff would give you way more leverage towards a good, a good outcome. Yeah. So that's all stuff if you wanna to go to our website and, and do, you know, check out our free videos and train them. Um, even basic training, like if, if I'm sorry, I know I'm getting long here, but I'll be, I'll be real quick. If you just did place command with leash and prong and you just did heel and you made them really like walk like angels and not break place command, you'd probably see very, very, very different behavior out of these dogs yeah. um, in a more general comprehensive sense. So go slow. Good luck. Go slow is Let my biggest, biggest recommendation. It's kind of cool if it all works out, which it should, because it seems like you've had good luck so far. Yeah. It's exciting. Yeah. Cool. Keep us, oh. keep us posted. Keep us 
you actually did like some sleeping in. Oh, did I? Didn't you? I slept for like one hour after I'd woken up at 3, 4, Oh, really? Five. Oh, yeah. I thought you slept till 8. Yeah, but I didn't go to bed till like, I woke up at like 3, 45 and didn't go to bed till And like worked seven. until like 7. Yeah, oh, <laughs> never mind. I thought you were like snoozing magoozy. No. All right, question okay. number 8. This is from Ladon. Mm -hmm. Ladon says, um, I mostly have people questions. How do you keep, I guess she's a trainer, right? Yeah, Ladon? I think so, yeah. How do you keep your people motivated to continue with the change after they're not at your side anymore? It seems as soon as they realize how much work it will take to keep the ball rolling, they get intimidated and fall apart. I have pups going home in a few weeks and one owner is absolutely balking at educating herself herself and her present pet before I deliver the pup. Again, I feel like I'm failing at being a motivator. Any help would really be great. I don't want to end up having them be rehabbed. I want them to start strong and ounce of pre prevention, so to speak. I know it's not a dog question, but boy, I would sure like to get my wrong right because apparently I'm doing it wrong. <laughs> It really is a dog question though. I mean, because yeah. it doesn't matter how good you train a dog, yeah. if you don't have great stuff with the owners, the, it, the dog stuff goes out the window. Yeah. So I want us to answer this in tandem. I've, I've got a few notes I'm gonna run down cool. and then I'm gonna have you, this is kind of our specialty. Yeah. And so you came to the right place, yes. Ladon. So let, let, me, let me run through a couple things for you. So for one, notes, <laughs> hang on. Um, for one, it starts with your website. Right? It starts with your pre-qualifying and it starts with your expectations and what you allow with your clients. Yeah. So to give a really brief thing, because we can't get into a super detailed thing, but like our website does a ton of pre-qualifying for us, right? Yeah. You can't just like get us on the horn and be like, I'd like my dog trained. You've got to go to our website. You've got to investigate our tools. You've got to know our prices. You've got to understand our methodology. You've got to be more excited about working with us than we are with working with you. Mm -hmm. Like, I don't mean that in a crappy way, but that's a, that's a real truism. Be <laughs> because it has a lot to do with what kind of people are gonna show up at your door. Mm -hmm. So then they fill out a contact form. If you go to our website, you can see how this all works. Fill out a contact form, and then we set up, uh, and they, they, they have to click in the contact form. I've seen your prices, I've seen your methods. Um, this is the program I want. I'm cool with e-callers, I'm cool with prong callers, blah, blah, blah. That does so much like getting rid of people that aren't down for the, for the work yeah. right there. Um, because it's a lot of work and then they send in a contact form and then we uh, contact them and set up a phone call and go from there and from there um, Brittany basically is trying to find out which program is right for them and if they're really right and down for the whole long haul mm -hmm. because we aren't interested in doing work with people that aren't interested in doing their work yeah. it's like it's not your job to be a motivator like it's your job to do your best when you're with a client like if Laura's my client and she really wants this my job is to to mirror that and give her the very very best to where she can succeed now if Laura's like I'm really excited about training her dog and Laura's like I can't wait to watch like Real Housewives of Beverly Hills like that's a bad combination and it doesn't matter it's just like any other relationship it doesn't matter how much you want them to do well yeah. if they're not ready you're stuck you're screwed you're not going anywhere yeah. and then the the real downfall is that you feel crappy about it mm -hmm. you feel like you've messed you're up messed like you up. said i'm not a good motivator i'm not doing that no it's not about you have to take steps back it's not that you're not a good motivator it's that you need to be more careful about who you let in your door that's where you make your best decisions about how you're going to make sure that your team is solid as a rock. Mm -hmm. So that's super duper important. Um, also, the problems and the kind of dogs that you work with has a huge impact on it. If you deal with like puppies, middle of the road dogs, dogs that don't really have big problems, what you're going to find is much more middle of the road kind of casual clients because their pain point isn't very high. Mm -hmm. Their pain point is like, oh, my dog jumped up on grandma and counter surfs. Yeah, it's a pain in the butt, but the pain point's pretty low. Yeah. Now, if you've got a dog that's attacking other dogs, crazy reactive on a walk and you can't even walk him, growling at people or children or has bitten people, the pain point is way up here. And that, and hey, get out of there. Yeah. The, the pain point is extremely high. And what comes with that pain point is a lot of commitment, a lot of investment, a lot of interest. So also how you market yourself and what service you're providing has an impact on the kind of people that show up through your door. Yeah. So those, you know, and if you don't want to work with heavy dogs, like that, 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 you know, doesn't make it easy for you. But, um, 
or, or just finding whatever specialty you want to find that really creates something unique for you rather than just kind of middle of the road stuff. Okay. Um, junior. Um, da, 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 and then. Long, long question. Yeah, sorry. No. Jump in. Yeah, so, Jump in. so we've got, we got, obviously, you got to get the right clients in, but you have to do your best to do, to create homework and create a program that isn't going to overwhelm your client as well. So if your client is great, let's just say, you know, let's say we got this stuff that Sean was talking about out of the way, you have a great client, it's, it's really important that we as trainers set up a good system that's not going to make the client feel like, oh my gosh, I have to become a dog trainer. You know what I mean? It's a good point. So yeah. you have, you know, the simplicity of what you send home and the simplicity of how they're going to live with their dog and how, the, how you like... Most of Sean's time when I first met him was spent sitting and literally like figuring out the best way to explain things to clients. Mm. Like he did that. That's what you guys see, these TGD tips and all these things that you guys see that come across the Facebook page. They're not just him being like, oh, let me think about it. This has been years in the making of him trying to figure out great ways to be able to explain it to people that aren't dog trainers. So you may have someone here who's just totally overwhelmed because she's like, and I don't know, your plan could be totally simple and she's a bad client, but I'm just giving the other side of it. If you have a client who's like, great, but she's like, oh my gosh, I can't, I'm not going to be a dog trainer. I've got three kids and like mortgage and I'm a lawyer and you can't, what do you mean? I can't do this work that you want me to do because you're a dog trainer. Um, it's best that you find a way to, you know, dilute it. Um, but really what, what Sean was talking about in terms of the trainer and motivation example, it's like, that's like someone blaming their personal trainer for them not being able to lose weight. Um, yep. if they've done a good job of like picking a personal trainer that's had results and then they're like, huh, he just can't motivate me to stop eating cake. It's like, <laughs> that's really not the trainer's fault. So it's the same thing with us. It's a you good, know, good example. You can only do so much. Um, but the best stuff that you can do is pick your right team. So pick your right clients and also make it nice and simple for clients because they're not dog trainers. Absolutely. And like I said, Check out our website, yeah. www.thegooddog.net. Mm -hmm. There's nothing happenstance or by accident on that website. Yeah. Everything is designed and put together to make sure that there's some very specific hoops for people to jump through, not, not to like push their buttons, but to ensure that they really are committed because if they're not, we don't want to work with them. We yeah. only want to work with committed clients because... Everything else is a bummer. Yeah. There's no getting away. You, that's what you're saying. This is a bummer. I'm doing this good work and I'm already feeling resistance. That's not a training issue. That's a choice of client issue. Yeah. So really hold on to that. And, and if you try and, try and wrap your head around how to tweak that, you can make some real big changes in, in, in the way your uh, work environment and relationships look with your clients. Cool. Cool? Thank you. Where okay, we at? Where guys. we at? Where we at? Question number nine. This is from Lori. On Sean Mache's page. Yep. Lori says, have you ever failed with the dog? And that doesn't mm -hmm. refer to adopting the dog. It refers to the dog that was untrainable, one that simply wouldn't get to where he or she needed to be. Junior. <laughs> the junior junior's my dog. Next Just kidding. question. Next question. I don't know where how this one got in there. <laughs> um, so Lori, good question, right? Yeah. Really, really good question. Um, uh, it's so first you kind of have to like define like failure um have we had dogs that have gone home and 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 the owners have struggled with absolutely but for me like i i'm a firm believer in that because we do a really good job of empowering clients that if the dogs do well with us and they don't do well with the clients that that's a client issue right and we're down to help and support and push and and all that good stuff but like if we can get a dog to behave really nicely and the owners can't, and we've given them all the help and all the support and all the work and all the tools, mm -hmm. that's, that's an owner issue. That's not a dog failure. So we don't classify that as a failure. Now, what I can say is that we've had a handful of dogs, I, I would say like two, three, four dogs maybe that I can, that I can recall. You might be able to like pull, pull some more out that you remember, mm -hmm. but, but dogs that had either physiological stuff going on or um, mental stuff, cognitive issues, where they were unable to process information normally. Yeah. Um, they were um, health issues. Health or, issues. Yeah. Um, could be like, uh, who was that? Was it Leon? So there was a dog named Leon, 
and um, really nice owners, but this dog struggled. And uh, hey, Laura, if I'm not mistaken, um, complete thyroid failure. failure, right? So physiological stuff. And uh, to be honest, you know, we, we tried to stay in touch and I don't know where things ended up with them. Um, but uh, he was a dog that you really, you, you couldn't communicate with or train. He was just kind of stuck. And um, so physiologically, he was really compromised. And, and we recommended that, you know, they, they get thyroid stuff. But that never really gotten, or at least we never really heard uh, anything, anything more from that. So, but then on top of that, there's been several dogs that have been like, um, to varying degrees, cognitively challenged. And those kind of dogs are dogs where you're like, they're actually sweet, easy dogs, but they don't respond to pressure. They don't respond to um, patterning. They don't respond to the e-collar or prong um, or any of that stuff normally. And you find them just, just struggling over and it's like Groundhog Day. You can teach and you can teach and you can teach and you really hit a ceiling. So for some of those dogs, we've had to compromise and just do like, okay, we're not, we can't do e-collar work because the dog cannot comprehend e-collar work. So then we'll just do leash and prong, simple stuff. Like we, we teach a place command, maybe tether the dog back. Owner can walk the dog on leash and prong, um, but there's nothing fancy. There's no like fancy off-leash recalls. There's nothing we've had to like adjust. Um, so I'd say we've had like three to four, maybe five of those guys um, to varying degrees with cognitive challenges. And like, are those failures? Like, for me, like a failure would be a dog that comes in, like a Gus. Like if anybody remembers Gus, like the Tibetan Mastiff, like a dog that's like not cognitively challenged, but is behaviorally really challenged. And to not be able to get, to not be able to get him into a good space, to me that would be a failure, right? A dog who's got all of the necessary components to be uh, a better dog and me not being able to, or us, the team, not being able to find a doorway in or the right technique or the right approach to get him there, that would be a failure. As far as dogs that are cognitively challenged or physiologically challenged, and it doesn't really feel like a failure, but um, it's always a bummer. It's always, you know, it's always sad and, mm -hmm. and um, typically the owners know something's going on and so half of what we provide for them is not just training but also like expert opinion and diagnosis about what's going on with their dog and yeah, all like that stuff. One of the most difficult dog aggressive dogs we ever had yeah. um, had the most like committed superpower superhuman owners that really like weren't like didn't want to like be dog trainers but yeah. like we're like so devoted to making this work for this dog that would be a client that would be a failure if that was another other owner's hands you know what i mean yeah that would be a dog that like you it's a super dog aggressive dog it could have relapsed and gone to like that's a yeah. dog that needs super hands-on and luckily had the most awesome owners you know to yeah. to hold that up and and keep those things going so yeah, so there's challenging dogs out there, yeah. and, and it doesn't get talked about a lot, but there are definitely cognitively compromised dogs. They're not everywhere, um, but when you come across them, you'll find that they don't process the same way, and you yeah. can really find some limitations or a ceiling with that. So yeah. ho hopefully that helps and clarifies. Definitely. Okay, guys, question number 10. Caddy Too there. Fast. He's always, he's, this guy's like always breaking through. Caddy Too Fast says, hey guys, thanks for answering my question last week. I think everyone agrees that the intro of e-collar to dog training was a game changer since dogs realize that distance is not at their advantage anymore. Yes, sir. I strongly feel the same could be said for training with baby monitor cameras since dogs would realize that your presence or lack of it is not advantage either. Uh -huh. Do you have any experience with this type of technology in your training? I've heard you recommend it for crate shenanigans when the owner leaves the house, I'd like to incorporate it in place and downstay command training, thinking a dog would stop breaking command just because the handler's in out of sight. How would the process of correction play out in this scenario? Thanks in advance. Good question, buddy. Mm -hmm. And do you have a caddy? That's too fast? You must. We need pictures. I want to see what this is all about. Um, okay. So, um, like, like I said, we use cams for um, crate stuff 
and we also use it for any kind of uh, counter surfing stuff, right? So if we've got a dog who loves, who will only counter surf uh, in the absence of people, then we set up a cam for that and e collar, or we hide out old school through the window and correct them through there. So those are those are the two main things that we use that technology for. Now, you bring up an interesting question because you can absolutely use it for this stuff, right? So if your goal is to like, I want to proof like a, a get a brom, brom, brom proof uh, um, place command and down command, you can definitely use a cam, right? So you can step out of the room, dog thinks you're gone, and you can watch what's going on, and as soon as he breaks, you can correct. Now the only issue is there's a high likelihood, there goes Junior just doing laps over your camera, there's a high likelihood of when you correct the dog for doing that, especially with you not being in the room, he's gonna break the command and move away. Yeah. Right? Not because he's being a jackass, but just because he's like, oh, I'm corrected, I'm not sure what to do, and then takes off. So at that point, you're gonna have to come back into the room and you're gonna have to call him back and put him back where you want him. So um, I'm not saying it couldn't work. It could be a really cool thing, it could be a really cool method um, to prove that stuff. We don't find we really need it much. Like, if you just pattern like place command really well and like step out of the room and keep an eye, you know, we found that to be super effective. But if you're finding that there's more challenges and you really want to go deeper, 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 yeah. like hats off to you, make it happen. Go for it. But just remember that if you correct and the dog doesn't see you in the room, and especially correct at some hotter levels, you're going to find the dog typically is going to break command and move. And then you have to. Is that Hercules? Herc. Or is that... Yeah. Okay, I thought maybe um, Gujo was picking it up. Um, and then uh, you're going to have to come back in the space to try and you know put the dog back. So yeah. just something to think about. But you can let us know how it goes. I mean, I, I don't see any reason why it couldn't work. It just it's not like you just sit there behind the cam and like correct, and the dog's like boink. Yeah. Unless the dog's super super patterned, and you get him right when he like does his one little paw. And you're not too hot, yeah. not too hot yeah. on the collar. You it's may be able to get it to happen. It depends on the dog. Mm -hmm. Some dogs are just going to be like, wah, mm -hmm. and take off. Okay, guys. Let's jam on it. What do we, we got? What do you got in store? Speed round? Okay. Everybody speed loves speed round. Speed round is going to go like this. I have some questions. Some are just written down here. Some are here. He's going to have 60 seconds to answer them. Do you want to take any of them? Uh-uh. No? All right. So after I do the, after I start, after I say the question, then I'm gonna start the timer for 60 seconds. Good? Okay. The first one is from Instagram, Katie Filler. Katie says, hey guys, I have a 16 week old Aussie. He's having problems with jumping on the furniture. He's gotten much better about not jumping on the couches when I'm in the room. And when he does, I immediately correct him. Good. Now he waits until I leave the room, and then as soon as I do, he's jumping on the coffee table and couch and taking whatever he can in his mouth. Scoundrel. Um, any suggestions? You guys are awesome. Thanks. All right, and... Is it time to go? Action. Boom! Okay, dog is jumping on furniture. Um, so, get yourself an e-collar tech mini educator off Amazon, 180 bucks, is that the right price? Mm -hmm. And um, all you do is, Get a get a nice working level. Get the go through the manual. Make sure you got a nice snug fit on the e collar. This is something like you don't even need to like train the dog really because you don't want him ever on the furniture. Get the e collar nice snug. Read the instructions. Know what the hell you're doing with the collar. Wait outside the window. Step out the door. Dog jumps up. You have to set him up. Baby cam, some kind of camera that you can watch him or through a window. Dog jumps up on the furniture, nice high level correction, bang, dog goes couch, chair, whatever, furniture, hot, I don't like it anymore. Repeat, rinse and repeat until the dog doesn't do it anymore. This yeah. will probably stop in two days. And 180 bucks you're spending on a collar, you might as well do the whole foundation stuff too, recall place. Yeah, I mean, the, but you only gave me a minute. That's what I would do. Okay. <laughs> Question number two of the speed round. We have B Kim. B Kim on Instagram, she says, hey guys, first of all, great hair, Laura. Uh, second, my question, we have a Jack Russell Terrier that we introduced to the prong since he was pulling our arms off during walks. Mm -hmm. Since prong and proper heel training, the walks are awesome. Fantastic. Only he bar barks at other dogs. Correcting with the prong seems to escalate him. He gets more annoyed and seems to bark longer when being pissed off. Any tips without the use of an e-collar? We haven't been able to buy one. Thank you. Okay, and little duct tape. Rip. Action. Okay, so um, here's what I do. Go to Learberg.com. I want you to order a dominant dog 
dog collar, which is gonna be a small one for this little guy. Um, I want you to use both the leash and prong, and I want you to use a separate leash on the dominant dog collar. So two leashes, sounds fancy, but you can make it happen. And then anytime you're walking this dog, and like use the leash and prong for heel position, keeping him in a good spot. But anytime this dog starts to amp up or get worked up, you're gonna calmly just stop. You're gonna take the dominant dog collar on leash and you're gonna just apply pressure up and you're just gonna pull up and hold. It's gonna be just like this. You can't see it, pull up and hold. And then the dog's paws, I want them to come off the ground just about that much. And you're just gonna hold and wait till your dog's like, and then you relax and you answer that. And you do that over and over again until your dog realizes all this monkey business gets me nowhere, is not very fun, is highly uncomfortable, and then he starts to make different choices down the line. Dominant dog collar will take the drive out of the dog yeah. rather than lifting up, escalating if you oh, can't use an e collar. Your dog. Sorry, we love you. Um, Catherine Freeman, I just wrote you on <coughs> Instagram. Uh, your question is a little more involved, so if you could post it again next week, or if please. you forget, we'll, we'll answer it, we'll try to answer it. Yeah. But please post it again next week, because um, we really want to answer that one like in full version, not just a speed round. Yeah. Um, speed round number three is Emily. Emily. Emily says, why are there horse sounds whenever Jeff Gelman appears on camera, or whenever we talk about him? I'm going to give you this one. You take it. It's quick. Um, we have a great picture of Gelman like 15, 20 years ago that he... 30 years ago. About 30 years ago, where he's on a horse. He's like bareback riding a horse. It's, and like, a, it's like a romance novel. Yeah, it looks like a romance novel and he's got no shirt on. And he's like, and his hair is like long and He's on a horse in, in the water. In the water. Yeah. yeah like, it's like, it's, you know, Gelman, like adventure <laughs> Gelman. And um, basically... It's the most hilarious picture we've ever seen. And, and so... Ever. And so, so Laura always plugs in horse sounds anytime. Like she used that picture a lot. That came up in a lot of episodes, and eventually it just got tied to just whenever Jeff came up, Jeff we got up. the horse sounds. Yeah. And then one last thing, Richard asked a question. Yep. Um, and Richard we Chan, to say, right? Richard Chan, that you should listen to number six on this episode here. Yeah, Richard. So uh, listen to my response for Bethany on number uh, number six, and she's got the same exact issue as you, and I recommend the same exact approach to. Resolving it, so no sense in answering a question twice. Um, do the uh, recalls with the long line starting short, and then getting more distance and more distance. Getting a dog to recall off the thing it's most interested in, and doing it in a very meticulous short, short to longer fashion, you'll change the game with that dog, and you don't. All right, keep talking about this. Still on. Oh, sorry. Uh, we were doing selfies for, for, for promoting this. And so uh, that's the best way to go about it. And whatever kind of corrections you need to use to make sure that that stuff works. Um, after you've been fair and taught the recall to the dog and then slowly introduced them to, to distractions, just like I said for Bethany, that there's nothing better I've found for getting dogs to behave accordingly around critters and such. Yep. So, Laura's meanwhile looking at, oh, that's awesome. so cute. <laughs> so, uh, guys, I, I think we're out, that's right? It. That's yeah. it. End of episode 57. Bang! We love you. Um, the start of the new year is when the new revamp is gonna happen. It's going to so, be good, isn't it? It's going to be exciting. It's going to yeah. be good. Yep. New so, intro, like fancy intro, everything's right? Everything's going to be fancy. I can't so. wait. I'm so excited. We got this lady on the job. Yes. She's going to be cooking up some great stuff for you guys. So, guys, we also, real quick, just to close out, yeah. we're probably going to need you guys to start giving the questions oh, yeah. quicker yeah. because what we need is we need more time for all this fancy fun stuff we're going to do to make the show better we need the an we need the questions from you guys submitted like Sooner. on saturday and like we need them in and finished by monday yeah right yeah. so you only have you're only going to have a couple days and anybody so who doesn't get them out the yeah anybody who doesn't get them out in time uh we've been pretty lax about it up until now but unfortunately we got some big plans for editing so if you're if you don't get them out until you get when them on like a speed round or something like that yeah not get a full answer. Chances are if you get them out on Wednesday, you won't make it on the show. So we're going to start adjusting that because we got big, big plans and want to do some really fun stuff so you guys really enjoy it. So we'll be tweaking that stuff. So bear with us, but it's going to be bomb ass, be if I can say that. Right, guys, guys, we out. Love you. See Bye. ya.